South Jamaica, baby, they made me to be the greatest. Serving the deed of my creators, fresh off of my high haters. It's the king again, Magdalene, Sophie bragging and boasting. Yo, what up, y'all? It's your boy Dollars. Welcome back to the channel. It's another day, another dollar video, and I'm going to be reacting to the history of Canada explained in 10 minutes. The title explains itself. It's the history of Canada explained in 10 minutes. I don't really know too much about Canada like that. I know Canada is bigger than Toronto, though. I'll tell you that much. You know, when people think of Canada, we only think about Toronto. But there's a lot of other places that's in the North America that I want to learn about. And um, yeah, let's just check this joint out. Let's see what we learn. Canada, known for their delicious maple syrup and being home to nearly all of the greatest hockey players of all time, is the second largest nation on earth and with approximately 2 million lakes, contains second over 50% of the freshwater lakes on the planet. For many thousands of Wait a minute, 50% of the freshwater lakes? 2 million lakes, contains over 50% of the freshwater lakes on the Damn. planet. For many thousands of years, this region was populated with many indigenous tribes of hardy people capable of Facts. overcoming the severe and lengthy winters, thriving and developing unique cultures. The first non-native people to settle in Canada, and the New World in general that we know of for sure, were the Vikings. They built a settlement in Newfoundland around 1000 AD. It is unclear mm. for exactly how long this settlement was occupied for, or if there was more, but ultimately it was either abandoned, pillaged, or its inhabitants succumbed to disease, or assimilated into the local population but theories abound. Nearly 500 years later in 1497, the Italian explorer Giovanni Capotto was the first European to explore North America's coast, claiming it for the English crown. Shortly after, the Spanish and the Portuguese would do the same. That shit always gets me. They claiming something that's not even theirs for another country when there's people there already. Like. <laughs> but remained uncolonized for several decades with only a few seasonal Portuguese and Basque fishing outposts built until the French arrived. Jacques Cartier claiming the land for France in 1534. He named the Gulf and River after St. Lawrence's feast day on which he arrived. The French called the territory around the river Canada after the native word for settlement. After several failed attempts at permanent settlement succumbed to starvation and disease, the cities of Quebec and Port Royal were successfully established. By 1670, the English colonies in the South had expanded and new settlements were established in Newfoundland and south of the Hudson Bay. The fur trade, particularly in beaver pelts, became extremely lucrative as it became the favored material for hat makers and luxury winter clothing in Northern Europe. This greatly encouraged further Northern settlement by both English and French fur trappers seeking to make a fortune. The French and the English did not peacefully coexist, with the French temporarily taking much of the territory around the Hudson Bay during the lengthy period known as the Beaver Wars. Not only the Europeans became wealthy and influential from the trade in beaver pelts, the Iroquois Confederation of six powerful tribes armed with European firearms initially Iroquois? allied with Dutch merchants and then the English to aggressively attack the French and most other Indian tribes in the region to obtain more furs. Many of these tribes banded together with the French to halt Iroquois expansion. Peace was negotiated. Let me guess, they're gonna ally with the French and then they're gonna get betrayed by the French. Negotiated after 72 years of fighting and many, mostly Indian lives lost. And little territorial change. The region of New France was comprised of several colonies. Canada and Louisiana were the largest, along with the smaller Placence and Acadia, which the British Empire obtained from the French in the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 in a complicated agreement concerning the War of Spanish Succession. You know what's funny? They should do a new uh, updated version of this, right? And I bet you see how it says Canada and, you know, France or whatever? Everything should just say China. France also recognized the legitimacy of the Hudson Bay Company's claim over Rupert's land. Interestingly, the Hudson Bay Company is still in existence today, primarily as owners of a retail store chain bearing their name. Despite their larger territory, the French increasingly became outnumbered by the rapidly growing British colonies surrounding them. By a margin of 10 to 1 by the time the next major conflict between the two occurred. During the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, as it has become known in much of North America. French-speaking Acadians were deported far from the Canadian borderlands, some of whom formed the basis of much of the Cajun population of modern-day Louisiana and New Orleans. Both English New and Orleans. French empires 
sent thousands of New regular Orleans. infantry to North America during the war, supported by local militias and Indian tribes. The greatly outnumbered French relied heavily on Indian allies and fought the British to a standstill early in the war, until the British successfully besieged the cities of Quebec and Montreal. Hmm. Despite the French later defeating the British in a pitched battle, they failed to retake their capital city. In the treaty that ended the war soon after, France ceded Canada to Britain while giving Louisiana territory to her ally, Spain. It is important to note at this time much of North America's non-coastal areas were still largely unpopulated, with many of the native tribes heavily depleted through warfare and invasive diseases from which they had little immunity. With a population of approximately 3 million, the American colonies waged a successful rebellion against the British crown. A little over a decade later, the Americans attempted and failed to take Quebec, which remained loyal to Great Britain. After the war, Damn, many I British know that. loyalists moved <laughs> north into Canada. During the following... America wanted to take Quebec. Imagine that. I was just thinking in the beginning of this video, like, imagine if Northern America was just America. Like, if Canada wasn't Canada, it was just America. Like, it would have been crazy. We all would have been one country. Like, that would have been crazy. Following War of 1812, both British and American armies launched several failed invasions of each other's territory, ending in military stalemate and the status quo was maintained. The treaties following the war established a more formalized border between the two nations. Despite the Canadians' desire not to join their American neighbors to the south, movements for self-rule increasingly grew among the Canadian lower and middle classes, culminating in the rebellions of 1837 and 38 that were severely dealt with and crushed and saw the short-lived Republic of Canada established by William Lloyd Mackenzie. Despite the Republic's short-lived lifespan and diminutive size, widespread public support not only from many Canadians, both French and English-speaking, but also from Americans to the South, spurred Great Britain's government to make major concessions in the rebellion's aftermath. The Act of Union in 1840 united Upper and Lower Canada into the new province of Canada, and the granting of responsible government soon after allowed for a far greater degree of self-rule to be exercised by the elected representatives of the people. In 1846, the pretty much they said, listen, Britain, you're all the way over there. Mind your damn business. All right, you're not over here. We out here. We in the field out here. All right, you can't tell us what to do from thousands and thousands of miles away. We ain't trying to hear that. The disputed Oregon Territory was peaceably divided between Great Britain and the United States, pretty much by drawing a straight line and giving Vancouver Island to Canada. Throughout the 19th century, we should have kept that. a massive boom in the logging <laughs> should industry have been America. fueled large waves of immigration to Canada, gradually replacing the fur trade as Canada's most lucrative industry. In 1867, the British North America Act, or more commonly called the Constitution Act today, established Canada as a self-governing democracy with Ottawa as its capital city. To the west, the Hudson's Bay Company oh, negotiated so the, the sale of land okay. to the newly formed Canadian government. The Métis people of mixed European, primarily French, and Indian ancestry were the largest population of the Winnipeg area of what is now Manitoba. Fearing the land they had held for generations would be seized by newcomers from the east, they rose in rebellion, creating a provisional government. And after a tense standoff and eventual occupation by federal troops, many of their demands were met, respecting their rights. The leader of the rebellion, Louis Riel, would lead another larger but less successful rebellion, 15 years later, that ended with his trial and execution. I was about Louis to say Riel they whacked him after that. Or villain to make. I was just about to say they whacked him after that. Like, oh, bro, you, you already doing too much. You got one W, and now you still trying to start some shit? You don't know when to take your wins and just chill. Many Canadians. <laughs> his death, increasing the tensions between Indian, Métis, English, and French groups in society. Because of the key role the partially completed transcontinental railway played in the suppression of the rebellion, political support for completing it soared among English-speaking Canadians, and the railroad was completed in only four years from when it had begun. The 1890s saw the Klondike Gold Rush, in which over 100,000 prospectors set out to the remote Yukon region in hopes of striking it rich. Some did, but most didn't. After several decades of stagnant population growth, largely due to emigration to the United States. Canada's population sharply increased due to a good economy and high foreign immigration throughout the early 20th century. During the First World War, Canada, still a dominion of the United Kingdom, sent 620,000 troops to fight in Europe. 67,000 would die, 
while another 173,000 would be wounded. Oh, shit. What the staggering is that? casualty rate grieved and shocked the nation. The mm. war had a strong impact on Canadian nationalism and the desire to self govern its own yeah, international affairs. We, we don't affairs, want to which be they part of the UK when no the British more. Parliament passed the Statute of Westminster in 1931 which acknowledged Canada's co-equal status with the United Kingdom. Between the world wars, Canada was hit particularly hard during the Great Depression of the early 1930s, with unemployment rates reaching 25%, and many men living in unemployment relief camps. During the Second Damn, World War, unemployment over relief 1. Camps. 1 million Canadians served Never in heard that, of that brutal before. conflict that left nearly 100,000 of them dead or wounded. In 1949, Newfoundland became the last Canadian province to incorporate. In 1965, Canada adopted its current flag. Here's a selection of some of the other national flags that were proposed. Let me know in the comments of which one do you think looks best. In 1982, the, one the Canada Act passed the Parliament of the United Kingdom and was ratified by the Queen, granting Canada the right to create their own constitution, which they promptly did. Still recognizing the constitutional monarchy in a mostly ceremonial rule, the new constitution abolished the British Parliament's remnants of influence over Canada. Canada is now a nation of over 36 million people, where over 20% speak French as a first language, and has the 10th largest economy in the world. The province of Quebec has maintained a strong French influence over the centuries, and has on two occasions voted in referendums to decide whether Quebec should proclaim national sovereignty and become an independent country. Nah. In 1995, it very nearly did not pass, with secession still mm. being an issue till this day. This has been Epimetheus. Let me know what you think down in the comments. What Canadian province is your favorite to visit or live in? Don't forget. All right. Yeah, I heard about that. Quebec, like, they feel like they better than the rest of Canada. They want to just separate and be their own thing. But nah, bro. You know what I'm saying? You're going to stay with Canada and that's that, man. We, we already have America, Canada, Mexico. Like, we don't need another country in the North America, bro. You know, but um, this was interesting, man. Very interesting information. If there's any other videos that you would like me to react to that's similar like this, you know, it could be about anything as long as it's interesting. So let me know in the comments down below. Yeah, I definitely want to go out there one of these days, man. But I don't know when, man. I don't know when that's going to happen with the way things are nowadays. So let's see. But yeah, this was a very informative video. I ain't going to lie. I always wanted to go to Canada too, like to move out there. But now I see how motherfucking restrictive they are and crazy they are with their laws. I'm good. I think I'll pass. But I still would love to go out there one of these days. It's your boy Dollars. i holla. If you're new to the channel, drop a like, subscribe. I'm out of here. For my time goes by, they gon' raise a nigga jersey in the sky. Treat a nigga right, big dreaming all my life. Sure they wanna get some air, I go and get up when I fly. Taking off when these niggas are retired. The minute I catch fire, I smoked them all before, just revisiting the high.